those uh, students sure gave it all they've got. I'm getting ready to give it all I've got too. I just don't have as much. (laughs) So you'll have to pray for me as you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 24. We are in Acts chapter 24. We'll start out by paying attention to verse 16. Acts 24, 16. If you've been tracking with us so far this year, we are right where we are supposed to be. We've been looking at the expansion of the early church. We've been looking uh, for the last little bit at the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And we are seeing him now in the same shape he will end the book. And that is imprisoned because of his faithful witness for Jesus. He is guilty of no crime. Uh, that has been the case, it will remain the case. But his faithfulness for Christ landed him in prison. And we're going to see today something that we can learn from a man from a couple of thousand years ago who was in prison for Jesus. We're going to start by reading about it in Acts chapter 24, verse 16. And this is what God says. So, I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Let's pray. Father, I want to ask that you would come and give power to me as a preach power to these others as they listen. Father, I pray that you would lead us into the truth. I pray that you would change us, make us different, make us better, make us more like Jesus, make us more like Paul, because we were together today. And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For coming up on a year now, I've been talking to you about revival in the themes that we get from the book of Acts. I've been telling you that revival is a mighty and a wonderful work of God where the lost are saved and the saved are sanctified in surprising numbers. We've looked at a lot of examples of that, not just from the book of Acts, but from church history as well. One of the things that I did a little earlier in the year was talk about one revival with which many of you are intimately acquainted. I called it the Great Jacksonville Revival, the mighty and wonderful work that the Lord did here at First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, where thousands and thousands of people were brought to faith in Jesus Christ. I think we need to acknowledge that for what it was. It was a great revival. If we acknowledge it as a great revival, it will protect us from all sorts of things. It will protect us from thinking that what happened in the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s here is something that uh, we can repeat. Sometimes we think, well, if we would just do this or if we would just do that, if we would just do what they did back then, then we'd get the same results they did. That's not true. Revivals are a mighty and a wonderful work of God. The Spirit... Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John chapter 3, blows wherever he wishes. And the Spirit blew in a mighty and a wonderful way to bring about revival in this place. And instead of thinking, well, we just need to create some formula that will always work in all times and all places, we need to praise God for his work in this place in a remarkable season. It also will make us thankful for what the Lord did and who the Lord used. 
I think you have to say, when you call that a revival, that one of the things we've talked about is that throughout the Bible and throughout church history, whenever the Lord does a mighty and a wonderful work, he always raises up a unique leader. And that leader in the history of our church was Homer Lindsay Jr. The Lord used him in a great and powerful way to do great and mighty works here in this place. One question I think about, and one question I hope you think about, what what was it about Dr. Lindsay Jr. that created such a magnificent reality here? Well, the first thing you have to say is something I've already said, that it was the work of God. He, he just had the hand and the power of God over his life. But that's the easy and the obvious answer. I wonder if there's something else that we can learn from the great Jacksonville revival and from this great servant that the Lord used to shepherd and steward that revival. I think there is, and I think it's something that we can learn from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, here in chains, on trial, says these words that have gripped me, and I hope grip you. He says as he is preaching Christ, he says as he is preaching the resurrection, he says as he is explaining his innocence. He says, I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Your conscience, the conscience, is that part of you. It is an invisible reality inside you. It's part of your spirit, and it is the function of your soul. It's the function of your spirit to testify to your guilt or innocence. We talk about a guilty conscience because we feel bad. We feel guilty for something that we've done. Or we talk about a clear conscience because we know, maybe in spite of accusations to the contrary, that we are not guilty. Whenever you do that, whenever you're aware of guilt or innocence, That is your conscience working. It might not be working the right way. You could be guilty and feel innocent, or you could be innocent and feel guilty. So it might not be working properly, but that's another subject for another day. The point today is that your conscience is that part of you that is aware of guilt or innocence. And the Apostle Paul says, with his conscience, I take pain. I work hard at something. In my inner man, in my soul, in my spirit, I work hard at something. And that is, I want my conscience to be clear before God and before man. Paul wants no guilt blocking his relationship to the Lord. He wants to be able to fellowship with the Lord, he wants to be able to serve the Lord, and he doesn't want a guilty conscience. He doesn't want the guilt of sin blocking his access to or his service of the Lord. But it's not just God. Paul also takes pains to have a clear conscience before man. He doesn't want guilt blocking his fellowship with people. He doesn't want guilt blocking his testimony to, and he doesn't want guilt blocking his service to people. Paul is actually concerned about both. He he wants a clear conscience before God, and he wants a clear conscience before man. If you only take pains to have a clear conscience in your relationship with other people, and you don't care about having a clear conscience in your relationship with the Lord, then you are a hypocrite. If you only take pains to have a clear conscience in your relationship with the Lord, but not in your relationship with other people, then you will be ineffective in ministry. 
It, it does matter what people think of you. It does matter, Paul thinks, whether your conscience is clear in your interactions with people. You can't be a slave to that. There comes a certain point, and we're going to see that in the ministry of the Apostle Paul, where after he's made his defense, after he has been clear, he has to sit there and trust the Lord. And he's going to wind up in prison with some people thinking he's guilty. But he took pains insofar as it depended on him to have a clear conscience before not just men but before God. Paul was authentic. Paul was real. Paul was the genuine article. And that is the most important lesson we can learn from Paul, I think, in Acts 24. And so what I want to do just for the next few minutes is talk to you. I've, as, as I've thought about what we would do together this morning, I've actually felt a little bit frustrated because what I would like to do is sit with each one of you and talk about this kind of authenticity. But there's nowhere near enough time for me to sit with each one of you individually and talk with each one of you individually and specifically about authenticity, about your authenticity. So what, what I want to do for the next few minutes is if you could just allow me the privilege of pretending this isn't a sermon, pretending I'm not standing here in front of all of you, or pretending I'm not just speaking to you if you're watching online or listening on the podcast. I, I would like it if we could in our minds, I pull up a chair to a table, and let's just talk about authenticity, just you and me together. I suspect that it is a lack of authenticity that is barring much of our fruitfulness for the Lord. I suspect that if you and I were a bit more the real deal, if we were a bit more the genuine article, that there would be more power in our individual ministries, and there would be more fruit in our labor for the Lord. Paul is up against it in Acts 24. He is not dealing in a politically friendly environment. He doesn't have a budget. He doesn't have the opportunity to gather a crowd in front of him anymore and preach the gospel and ask for a response. He is chained up in front of a very small audience and he gets to speak when he is permitted to speak, and he has to shut up the rest of the time. He's very limited. But he's got something going for him here that's not the outward accoutrements of the kinds of ministry that we enjoy when we have freedom and when we have churches and large churches and budgets. He's got something going for him that's not any of those things. And I think what we see here is he's got real authenticity. He is real. He is the real deal. And I think if we had more of that in our lives and in our hearts, we'd be more effective in ministry today. And so I want to talk to you about your authenticity, and I want to ask you if you could grow in your authenticity in two ways, just two. I want you to, as we, I'm trying to talk just to you, even though we're all here, and I want to ask if we could just lock in together about two ways that you could grow and be more authentic, as was the Apostle Paul. Here's the first way I think we could all grow and be a bit more authentic. 
you need to be authentic in your teaching. In your teaching. Now, if that sounds like a weird thing to say, if I'm catching you out of the blue on that, stick with me for a second. We have here in Acts 24 authentic teaching from the Apostle Paul. He says in Acts 24, verse verse, uh, 15, that he has a hope in God which these men themselves accept that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. In Acts, one of the things the Apostle Paul talks about the most is the resurrection. He sometimes talks about our resurrection. That's what he's talking about here. The resurrection of the just and the unjust. But the foundation for these folks' resurrection, the foundation for your resurrection and for my resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ really was alive. Jesus Christ really did die. And then Jesus Christ really did rise. It's really true. And when you turn from your sins and trust in Jesus, his resurrection will be your resurrection. And you will be able to live your life knowing that whenever you face your eventual death, that death for you who trust in Jesus is not a wall that brings everything to a stop, that brings everything to an end. That that death is a door is a door to a world that never ends, is a door to a world that is full of infinite joy and bliss. And every day when you wake up, if you could imagine it, you feel a little bit better than you did the day before. There's a little bit more of the love of God. There's a little bit more of joy and fellowship. And we get to experience that forever and ever and ever when you trust in Jesus. This resurrection has to do and is only possible with the resurrection of Jesus. Now, listen. The resurrection of Jesus and of you and me when we trust in Jesus, I want you to know it sounded just as silly to these people who didn't believe as it does to us. The resurrection is an amazing reality that you can only accept by faith whether you were alive back then or whether you're alive today. But the Apostle Paul tells the truth about it, even though it sounded zany. He tells the truth about Jesus' work. He tells the truth about our response to Jesus' work. If you look in Acts 24, verse 24, He heard, Felix did, Paul speak about faith in Christ Jesus. It's not just that the resurrection is true. That's not merely what brings about your own resurrection. It's that you've responded to that resurrection by believing it. You say, you know, I think that's true. (laughs) I think this crazy thing called a resurrection is true, and I don't just acknowledge that it's true, but I rest in it. I hope in it. I say, as you need to say, if Jesus is still dead, listen, this, is, this has to be the cry of your heart. If Jesus is still dead, I'm toast. But if Jesus is alive, then in him forever, I am alive. I get a resurrection. You have to believe it. Paul was authentic. That it's not enough to know about it. It's not enough to talk about it. You've got to rest in it. He talks about consequences too. He goes on in verse 25. He reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. There's a judgment that is coming. And deep in every heart, you know it's true. Every every heart knows that this judgment is coming. You suppress it, you bury it, you try to pretend like it isn't so, you try to make believe that everything's gonna be happy, but it's not, and everybody knows it. 
And Paul tells the truth about these things. He tells the truth about these hard things, resurrections that sound incredible. I mean, incredible, not credible. He tells the truth about judgments that sound harsh and scary. But Paul is authentic in his teaching. And we need to be as well. See, I think a lot of us, I think a lot of you are inauthentic in the teaching. Hold on a second though, because this is the Apostle Paul. I'm not an apostle. I'm not even a pastor. I'm an electrician. I'm a housewife. I'm a nurse. I'm an administrator someplace. But listen, there is a Christian teaching, there is a set of Christian truth that is real and is yours. In Jude chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The Bible says it is your job, it is your job to contend for this faith, to contend for this truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, listen to this. Follow the pattern of sound words that you heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. When you trust in the resurrection of Jesus, it doesn't just mean that you get a resurrection. It doesn't just mean that you live forever. It means there is a deposit of truth that has been handed to you, and it is yours to guard it. And I think a lot of you don't do it. I think a lot of you are inauthentic. I think a lot of you come here, and you go to Sunday school, and you go to church, and you go to your grow groups, and you love the good deposit of teaching that you get when you come here, you wouldn't come. If we, were, if we were fudging on the truth, if we were given on the Bible, you wouldn't come here. So you love to come to a place where you can get good teaching, but then you like flip a switch in your heart and you walk out into the community, you walk out into your neighborhood, you walk out into your job, you walk out into your school, and nobody hears a blessed word about it from you. You're inauthentic. You, you try to have it both ways. You want to be strong and faithful, stand on the word at church. But at Panera, at your college class, with your friends on the street in the neighborhood, you, you present a different reality. And you compromise the teaching. You compromise the truth by not talking about it. You're inauthentic. And just you and me, I want to ask if you would make a commitment today. Lord, that whatever, whatever it means to be real before you, I'm going to receive this deposit of truth and tell others about it. Lord, make me an authentic man. Lord, make me an authentic woman. Lord, I don't want to be a fake. Some of you are fake. And you need to look at the Apostle Paul. And you need to see how easy it would have been for him to be fake. It would have been so easy to be fake. He lets us know in verse 21, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you this day. He knows the teaching is getting him in trouble. But he doesn't stop because he's real. In uh, verse 25, when he talks about the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed. The guy who can get him off the hook is alarmed. Now listen, you're not supposed to say alarming things to the guy who has the key to your cuffs. Right? That's the rule if you're inauthentic. 
But if you know that this truth is real, it is a deposit that you have received, and you must tell the truth or people die, then now all of a sudden, authenticity sounds better than living a life without rebuke, without reproach. So what, what step could you take to be real, to be genuine, to be authentic? Second thing, it's just said two things. You need to be authentic in your teaching, and you need to be authentic in your integrity. You need to be authentic in your integrity. You need to be authentic in what you say about Jesus and the Bible, and you need to be authentic in your life lived before God and others. It's amazing the lack of authenticity that exists with everybody in the account except Paul. The people who are accusing Paul are inauthentic. They are characterized by flattery. This Tertullus comes up. He's the spokesperson paid by the Jews to do a really good job to see if we can get this guy locked up and the key thrown away or better to them, executed. And so Tertullus stands up before Felix and he says, since through you we enjoy much peace and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere. We accept this with all gratitude. Suck up. (laughs) Right? He's a big suck up. He's a flatterer. And not just that, he is a liar. Verse 4, but to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague. There's the hammer. He's a plague. One who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now, this is not true. You know it. We, we looked at this in chapter 21. In chapter 21, verse 27, the seven days were almost completed. The Jews from Asia, seeing Paul in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. The rioters are the liars. They're the religious leaders. Paul is as innocent as the day is long, but they lie. They are in authentic. They have no integrity. Paul, he's kind. He's not a flatterer. He's kind. In chapter 24, verse 10, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. And then he tells the truth. In verse 11, you can verify that it's not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. There's no evidence. But what's evidence when we need to get rid of somebody? What's a small little thing like the truth? When we, need to, when we need to send somebody out of town and kill them. The Apostle Paul is authentic, and it is his accusers that are inauthentic. It's not just the accusers that are inauthentic. It's also the person who would hear the case. Felix is keeping him locked up. He's going to keep hearing him over and over and over again. And in verse 26, it says, at the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. Did Felix want to hear about the truth? Did Felix want to hear Paul prattle on about judgment and resurrections and faith in Jesus? Of course not. Felix wanted money, and he's hoping this guy will get the hint. And if you'll just just grease my palm a little bit, then you'll be out of here, Paul. And how easy it would have been to just give a little bribe. He took up that money for the Jerusalem collection. He had friends. He could, he could, have, he could have paid a little bribe. He doesn't need to be there anyway. It's not his fault. He is innocent. So why not, why not just toss a little money to the guy who can let you go? Why not fudge on our integrity in our life? Why not just say whatever we got to say at work to get the boss off our back? Why not just say whatever we got to say at home to get the spouse 
off our back. Why don't we make this little cheat on our taxes or leave work just a little bit early and not tell anybody? These small little snips at our integrity. A little cut here, a little cut there. Why not do that? Well, the same reason Paul didn't. Because people are watching. And the Apostle Paul has been clear. I am on trial for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's the big question. What kind of person does Jesus' resurrection create? Does Jesus' resurrection create people who pay bribes when it's convenient or lie when it's convenient? Or does Jesus' resurrection form and fashion people who have integrity, who tell the truth when it hurts, who do the right thing when it hurts? Well, Jesus' resurrection creates people who are authentic. And if you are not an authentic person, then you have not met Jesus. Paul knows people are watching. And he knows that whether people believe in the resurrection or not is at stake in what he does. If he pays the bribe to Felix, well, Felix, I know he's just like everybody else who cherishes their freedom and their comfort and their joy more than anybody else. But Felix has to be thinking, what is it about this guy who always talks about the resurrection and won't give even a little. Where are you damaging your integrity? Where are you making a little cut here, a little cut there, and people see, and they know you're a fraud, and so they know this Jesus you sometimes talk about, if you talk about him at all, you know he's not much. Well, they go, they go to church, but, uh, but I see the way they treat the neighbors. I know that's not real. More often than we know, our authenticity hampers the spread of the gospel because we don't say what we know we need to say. We don't do what we know we need to do. What did God do to spark a revival in the early church with a man that just a few people are listening to? He doesn't have freedom, he's got chains. He doesn't have money, he's got the expectation of a bribe. He doesn't have a large audience, he's got a small audience that determines whether he lives or dies. He doesn't have people who love to listen to him. He's got people who hate what he has to say. But he's got one thing going for him that the Lord uses mightily, and it is his authenticity. I think, among other things, that's what Homer Lindsay had going for him in the great Jacksonville revival. You can say what you want, about him, but he was real. He was real. Nobody thought for a second that he had anything other than love for Jesus Christ, trust in him, and commitment to the church of Jesus Christ. The power of God, when it joins up with an authentic heart is a force that no worldly power can defeat. What if the barrier to the next great work of God in Jacksonville was you? Your heart that had not been fully given over to Jesus? What if it is your inauthenticity in teaching and integrity that is the sin 
that the Lord is waiting to conquer before he shines his light of love in this city. You might not have much going for you. You're not in prison because I'm looking at you. You might not have much going for you. But if you could go to the powerful Christ and say, I believe you. I trust in you. I want you to make me a real man. I want you to make me an authentic woman. I want you to make me a genuine follower of you, and I'll lay everything aside for that. The power of God, when it joins up with an authentic, godly man or a woman, is an unstoppable force. And we have yet to see today what it will do when they're joined up. So let's stand together and let's pray and let's ask God to fix us. Father, we need you to fix us. We are not the people we should be. Father, I pray first for the people listening who have not trusted in Jesus Christ. All this talk about resurrection and faith and judgment, it sounds like a foreign language. Father, I pray that you would press the truth into people's hearts and that that person right now who knows they are not trusting in you or who knows they never have trusted in you. Father, I pray right now that they would believe. I pray right now that they would rest all of their hope in you. And Father, for those of us who are walking with Jesus, Father, would you fix us and make us authentic in what we say to an unbelieving world? Would you fix us and make us authentic in how we behave before an unbelieving world? And then, Father, by a miracle of divine grace, would you add your power to our authenticity? And would you save Jacksonville? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.